Modern gaming feels like a chore. Oh boy. Modern gaming has slowly begun to feel like a chore. And before you say something like, You're just growing out of the hobby. You're just getting older. I don't feel this way towards older games that I am now playing for the first time, or several indie titles. No, this feeling mainly comes from the mainstream AAA games released over the last few years. And I know I'm not alone in this, as it's one of the most common topics brought up in forums and discussions in the broader gaming community. I you think know? the reason why is because of the focus on an achievement system. And the problem is, like, if you look at something like Armored Core 6, think about how many people criticized Armored Core 6 for not being a chore. Oh, it isn't just one or two niche communities that feel this way. Many different types of gamers are sharing a similar sentiment. And game development technology mm -hmm. has only gotten better and better, and games have only become more and more ambitious. So from an objective standpoint, gaming should be better now than ever before. So why do so many gamers share this sentiment? I think that gaming is better now than it was before. I think that it, by far. But I think that it, it's not if the only thing that you're consuming is AAA titles. Like if you're going after and you're trying to find, like for example, like for me, how many games this year have come out that have been like really, really fun to play? Uh, like in the past like six months or so, like I've had Armored Core 6, like this game's been really fun. Blasphemous 2, I played that. Coffin of Andy and Laylee, like Death Must Die, Entrouded came out recently. Dude, this game was so fucking fun. And I'm still not even done with it. Grand Blue Fantasy just came out. This game's really fun too. Like, I think there are so many great games. And I really wish that people would stop looking at the latest Ubisoft release and then basing their opinion of the gaming industry as a whole off of that. I'm so tired of that. Again, there's always the... You're outgrowing gaming. You're nostalgic yeah. for the past. You're just burnt out. And while these are applicable to some, I don't think it fully represents the full picture, and the problem goes far deeper than these very surface level explanations. So I want to look at that first point. Old games don't feel like a chore, but new ones do. Why? What's the difference between new and old game design that separate them from one another? Well, there's quite a lot actually, and we're not going to be able to cover all of them in this video, um... but one of the most important things to me is... Old games rarely wasted your time. They got you right into the action. Right into Yeah, the and this is a big difference between like live service games and like just box games that you can play offline. There's no reason for Dark Souls to make it take a really long time for you to get a Black Knight Halibird. And it doesn't. Like if you like you could get one at the beginning of the game, right, from that one guy, and there's a really good drop chance for it. It's like what, 16, 20 percent, something like that, from the guy at the bottom of the uh next to the gr the grass shield. It's really common. And uh if you don't get it, then you get something else. And like think about Monster Hunter. The rarest items in Monster Hunter take you a fraction of a time. Actually, I don't know about the rarest items, but it's like that's some of the decorations. But like, for example, getting a mantle for like a, a hard boss, this is a fraction of the difficulty that it takes to get something in a live service game. Because live service games win based off of making you play the game longer, and games like Dark Souls or Monster Hunter win by making you love the game longer. And that's the difference adventure and other than metal gear solid most games didn't oh, have hours man. of cutscenes or tracking across oh. open expanses of nothingness to get to the next point of interest no farming for oh material. i think that games like um shadow of the colossus i remember i watched my friend jason play a lot of it and there was a lot of time periods where like you were just kind of not doing anything you were moving around from point a to point b and i think that's okay that's not really a big deal it just depends on like how the game is designed and like what the focus of the game is. It's the atmosphere. Yeah, I think the atmosphere for a game is very important. ...or grinding XP. No climbing hundreds of towers to reveal the dark part of a map. And most importantly, nobody said things like, You gotta spend at least 20 hours in this game before it gets good. You know, you could tell well, right away... They said away, that about MMOs back in the day and nobody plays them anymore. ...if the game was gonna hook you. Let's take New Vegas and Starfield as examples. Oh. We're going to compare the first 60 minutes of New Vegas versus the first 60 minutes of Starfield. In Fallout New Vegas, you get a brief intro cinematic to set up the world of Fallout, 
and the main plot that New Vegas would revolve around. You immediately wake up in a doctor's house. He helps you set up your character stats and character creator. You stumble outside and begin talking to a few folks in town. You learn the basics of combat and survival from one of the characters. You then involve yourself in a conflicting quest to either help the town against a bunch of escaped convicts, or help the convicts take over the town. And in the process of all that, you've learned about skill checks and branching quest design that will affect the game forever. And in the aftermath of whichever choice you choose, you now know almost everything you'll ever need to know for the rest of the game, and you've pretty much wrapped up your first hour of New Vegas right there. Obsidian then hands you the reins to just go play the game. Just do whatever Complete the fuck. Complete freedom from yep. here on out. In fact, you can wake up and run straight out of Good Springs immediately, if you wanted to. Now let's take a look at Starfield's first hour. You're gonna spend about 10 minutes slow walking while NPCs ramble to you. You pass out and wake up, create your character stats, slow walk for another 10 minutes with more exposition dumping, fight off a group of pirates for about 20 seconds, slow walk and then exposition dump some more, interact with your loading screen, I mean, your ship, walk around a barren planet, shoot a couple more pirates, and then somehow, after that first hour, the game becomes even more restrictive and slow and you will spend the next three hours doing nothing but slow walking and talking to NPCs to tutorialize you some more. Another five hours of fetch quests and radiant quests go by, and then by maybe hour 12 or 13, you have a similar level of freedom that you did after the first hour of New Vegas. I mean shit, by hour 12 in New Vegas, I'd be balls deep in uncovering a cannibalism conspiracy inside the Ultralux Casino. Hell, even at hour 6, Jesus. I'd already sent some ghoul- Jesus, boys. You know what YouTube should do is they should categorize every Starfield video as ASMR. They should make it to where, like on Twitch, if you play Starfield, you're in the ASMR category. Into outer space and games just combine the two. Feel like a chore when they waste your time or they take too long to get going. And even when they do get going, <laughs> it's not that good. <laughs> and while not everyone feels like Starfield is a chore to play. I think it's more than safe to say that Starfield has been a very large disappointment for many for this very reason. Sure. If you want to explore, you'll have to go to your menu, zoom out of the planet, zoom out of the star system, navigate to a correctly leveled star system and fast travel. Then you watch a loading screen, a landing animation, and walk in a straight line for three to five minutes until you reach a point of interest. Unfortunately, none of these points of interest are interesting. At best, you'll find a copy-pasted pirate camp, and at worst, you'll find a planet trait, which is useless unless you're trying to fully scan a planet, or a cave with a few alien enemies and basically nothing in it but starfield i don't know how this happened Starfield is just the most recent example of a game that wastes the player's time we could discuss forever about the 20 hour feature films in the sony playstation catalog or the over hey no that's totally fine because people get that like and also the gameplay in god of war I haven't played the new one, so I'm speaking secondhand here, but I've never heard a lot of bad stuff about it. It seems like people really like these games. I, I am not a disliker of cinematic games, but it's not the same as God of War like 2 or something like that. Noted in tedious gameplay design of Ubisoft titles or other generic game studios. Or we could talk about live service games Ooh. that every few months give players 30 hours of busy work. New to thing to do. Out. It doesn't matter the example, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Modern games that love to waste your time, and only focus on getting you to spend as much time as possible inside their game. Yep. Why? Well, because of a game Because they have a store, and they want you to spend money in the store, and so the longer you play the game, the more likely you're going to play, you're going to open the store. And that's why a lot of loading screens have advertisements for things in the store. That's why, for example, with Diablo 4, it's really cool that they show your characters together whenever you zone into a dungeon with your friends. But that's also for the purpose of showing off microtransactions that other people in the group also have. So everything is built around. You have to understand that whenever a game has a store and it's a live service game, almost every single game acts as a funnel into the store. So it's like the tail wagging the dog. The store is what decides what happens in the game. Everything is built off of that, and that is the deciding variable whether something will be successful or unsuccessful in the game. Is that true, though? There's a relationship between hours of play and purchase? 
I think that, yes, I think it's very obvious that if somebody plays a game more, they're going to be more likely to buy something in it. Do we really need a study to tell us this? It's obvious. Out and it has a 12 hour runtime. Mm -hmm. Gaming journalists and basement dwellers will publicly crucify the game for not being long enough. You know, I can see it now. Bioshock released. I don't agree with that point. I don't think that's true. I think that, for example, uh, Armored Core 6 didn't get crucified for being too short. People were disappointed that it was too short, or it wasn't longer, I mean, because they wanted more game. But I think that most people were happy about it. In today's timeline would have 10 hours of cutscenes added on top of it, and several NPCs would have radiant quests to complete, with the game totaling to over 40 hours. Because longer means better, yeah. am I right? Wrong. That is absolute Ooh, wrong. wrong. True. Older games rarely would waste your time, though. They knew that people had a limited time to play games. Yeah, I really noticed this a lot with Monster Hunter, is that... I very rarely in Monster Hunter felt like I was actually wasting my time. Like, I was just playing a game, and it was the same thing with, like, Elden Ring. And I think one of the biggest determining factors is whether the game is a live service or not. Because live service games profit whenever you play the game more, so it's in their interest to waste your time. And games that aren't live service don't do that. Now, there are great live service games that don't do that. But there aren't as many of them. And that people are interested in playing other games. You know, I can play Assassin's Creed 2 over a weekend. Maybe like an extra evening yeah. on a weekday too. And that's awesome. I didn't waste two months grinding it like I did with Valhalla. And because it doesn't take so long to get through, I go back and play it at least once a year. Because I know it won't eat up a whole lot of my time. But what about big lengthy RPG games? I love them. And yes, they can take a while to play through. For instance, I loved my time with Elden Ring. Yeah. Put close to 100 hours in my first character. And Same. Elden Ring seems like the perfect candidate for replayability, with the amount of builds and ways to approach mm -hmm. the game. But the thought of replaying Elden Ring is a bit daunting. You know, I've played through Dark Souls dozens of times. And like Assassin's Creed 2, I play it at least once or twice a year because while it's possible to spend 80 hours in a single playthrough, my replays have been closer to 15 hours. RPGs that are more dense than expansive are... I think that he's right about Elden Ring, that it's harder to replay the game because there's just so much that's going on in the game. Like, I, I agree with him. Ones that I always find myself going back to more often. Or just games in general. Again, this doesn't mean... Yeah, large... Dark Souls feels like a game that could have come out on Super Nintendo. I don't know, like, does that make sense to anybody? Like, that's the way I feel about it. Expansive RPGs are bad at all. They just need to respect my time. Yeah, I do think Elden Ring did do that. It's just not something I'm looking to replay quite yet. Baldur's Gate 3 is a good example of a game that's huge. It's a behemoth of a game. Yeah, but I think you can ask anyone, including myself, about their time with that game, and none of its playtime feels unnecessary or tedious or grindy. It's just a behemoth in a good way. Every hour is made up of worthwhile and what feels like necessary content. The real difference between a good lengthy game and a bad one is playing a lot of hours because you're actually invested in the game versus hurrying through hours of tedium in order to get to the fun parts of the I game. I think that like really, this is what I wish a lot of developers did, is they had a metric for like when people start skipping cutscenes. Because I feel like there's so many games that are, like I like I remember Wayfinder was like this for me, where it was like I wanted to pay attention to the story, but I actually really wanted to play the game, and so every time whenever I play a new game, one of the things that I hate the most is whenever a new game does a one hour exposition of all of these things because i'm not going to remember any of this because like i don't have like so the way that memory usually works is that you remember things in like a web where it's like oh i remember this because i connected to this or i remember this because i connected to this so if you give somebody the whole thing and then it's like oh yeah you have to know all of this well they're not going to because they won't remember any of it because it's like oh well this thing that happened like who cares what this thing is and so I, I just, I wish that more games realized, like, how much of their time 
they just waste. Like Grand Blue Fantasy Relink was like this for me too. Like I played Grand Blue Fantasy Relink because I saw the gameplay and I thought to myself, holy fuck, this game looks really cool. And I'm spending all my fucking time sitting here watching cutscenes. I'm just, oh, fuck. Oh, God. Oh, yeah, 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 right. There's a, so there's a chosen one, and then there's, like, this girl. She got kidnapped, right? Okay. Okay, where's the boss fight? And that's it. You can skip, though. But my point is that you shouldn't want to. That's my point. My point is that... I wish that games would make it to where the story... Like, here's a great example. Path of Exile. I love the story in Path of Exile because whenever you click on the lore items in the game, you can continue playing the game while the lore is playing and you can listen to it. That's fucking awesome. I love that. Game. There are times in modern games, especially live services, that I would often be thinking about the literal chores I need to do in between the fun. Doing all the live service style bullshit. Did I play this hours one? Of tedious quest I don't know if I did. And more I mean, hours of inventory management. Played a game that was like I was that. mostly relieved when I finally stopped playing the game for the night. Maybe 30% of my time in the game was actually having fun. Really? Grinding for XP and materials to advance isn't a massive problem if the grind is reasonable. But we all know that in most games... <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, no, I, I feel like... So games that I feel like the grind was fulfilling and fun. I liked the grind in Monster Hunter. I liked it in Dark Souls. I liked it in Elden Ring. I will tell you, I liked the grind in New World uh, for like uh, professions, like gathering professions. I liked it, even though it took a very long time. Uh, it was like a much more long-form version of it. Um, I like the grind in Pal World. I think that was fun. Uh, uh, what was enshrouded, the grind has been really fun. Uh, it, it's reasonable. Uh, I would say even this might be an unpopular opinion, but I think some points in Valheim, the grind is too much. I think that it's fucking annoying having to go back to the swamp constantly whenever you're in the Mistlands. It's fucking annoying. So yeah, I, I, there are games that the grind is bad that aren't live service. But overall, I mean, fuck. Valheim's a great game. I totally recommend it, but that's just one thing that I don't like about it. Is that just isn't the case. Mm -hmm. And again, the grind is always extended not for the player enjoyment, but to either pad out runtime in a game or make you invest more in order to become addicted. After a while, it became sort of stressful to play these games, like a genuine second job. I'm sure you've heard that several times. Well, I feel like a lot of them, like this is the, th this is the, how many of you guys have played a game and you loot an object in the game and it says one of 509? Yep. Whereas I got all of them, by the way. Games made with genuine intentions I always find myself truly invested into because I wanted to be, not because it required me to be. Games like these tend to consume my thoughts because of the world, the characters, the badass builds I'm experimenting yeah. with. I become obsessed with it. Not saying it's healthy for a game to consume your life in that way it either, is. but at least you're genuinely enjoying the game healthy. because of the game, not because you're trying to check off a to-do list. Moments in games like, ah shit. I failed Siegmeier of Katarina, and I have to relay the bad news to his daughter. I wonder where she is. And then I spend several hours playing and adventuring, thinking about Siegmeier's story, and trying to find his daughter. Well, or, also you're like me. Oh, you mean the fat guy? Yeah, whatever happened to him? Oh, wow, it's a new boss. Let's go get it. Like, I I'll, I'll learn about the lore from a video. I don't give a fuck. And that's the good thing. That's good. Because, like, I can enjoy and appreciate the lore on my own time, but I can also play the game and enjoy the game for what I want it to be. And that's one thing that I wish more games respected. It's like another great example of this is Blasphemous. I feel like Blasphemous is one of the only games that's had the same type of storytelling as From Software. And the story is good enough for me to watch two one-hour YouTube videos about it. 
I feel like it's like one of the only games. So working through other It's so good. It's so amazing. And I appreciate it more than a game with good cutscenes. Playing and move forward. That's what I think. Now, it would be wrong not to dive a bit into the reality of gaming burnout, which can also be a big reason some find gaming to be a chore. So let's talk about that. In today's gaming culture, there is a lot of social pressure surrounding the enjoyment of certain games. Like, you must like this game and praise it. Or if you enjoy this game, then you're an elitist. The online culture of video games can get pretty exhausting because everyone has become extremely opinionated and upset with everyone else's preferences. Um... So we see a lot of this is just these are people with mental illnesses on the internet like there's no reason to, to, to listen to them at all die away from playing certain games and trying to go along with public opinion and play what's popular or what's considered the thing to play in the broader gaming community and i know we've all been guilty of this myself included I've played yeah i'll play games, games because they're popular i definitely will games where i really just pushed through them despite not really enjoying the experience you know they just weren't for me and they ended up being a chore mm -hmm. to play through and it's easy to get caught up in this i must play this because everyone online is hyping it up idea i used to have the vibe of like i thought oh man i'm never gonna really like a game again i'm never gonna have an experience like i had in ocarina of time link to the past super mario world World of Warcraft the first time, and then I played Elden Ring. And I said, wait a minute. It's not me, it's you. I said, nope, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> no, it's got nothing to do with getting older. But some games just aren't going to click with you, and that's okay. Dark Souls 1 was the same, I've too. Used to finding the difference Elden Ring was, like, much more I was aware of, though. Slogging my way through them for the sake of saying that I've done it. At this point, for myself at least, if I'm not feeling a game after the first few hours, I'm not going to force myself to see it through just to say I've done it. Game yeah, that's so weird to me. Like, every game that I've always really enjoyed, there's been almost no game that I hated at the beginning, and then I, didn't, I then grew to like it. I feel like almost every single game, I hated it at the beginning, and it was bad. The idea that games should be, they should get good, no. A game should be good at the very beginning, and if it's not, it's a bad game. Burnout really can set in when you start treating it like a checklist of games completed. But now, I value my gaming time more mm -hmm. than I used to. I don't feel as much of a need to be that gamer that's played everything. And I've been better off for it with that D4? mindset shift. The best part of D4 is can also just come No, the play. best part of the Diablo 4 story, and I'm going to give you guys a hot take, I think the only good part of the Diablo 4 story is the intro. I think everything else about the Diablo 4 story is so cringe. It's so formulaic. Like, it's, it's better than Diablo 3. Oh, wow. But it's like, oh, well, Inarius, it's like the bad guys are the good guys and the good guys are the bad guys. Wow. Daring today, aren't we? Holy fuck. Just the story wasn't that interesting. It just wasn't to me. There were only a few good parts of the story, in my opinion. I don't get why we killed Lilith still. Well, because Inarius was telling the story and you didn't get her perspective, that's why. Of Deterial? Yeah, the only good part after the beginning was whenever the, uh, the guy at the end died. From, like, he got too close to the pillar and then the guy just killed him from the pillar. That was the only bleak, fatalistic point that reminded me of the same vibe that Diablo 2 had. Everything else was just cinematic garbage. Spoilers? Too bad, you should have played the game. Things simply because of sunk cost fallacy, where you feel like you just can't. That was so dumb. Game. I know. Usually a live service one because of the hours you've put into it. But sometimes you just need to hang up your hat and call it quits if you aren't. That's why I liked it. That you once adored. Sometimes you are the problem. But all that being said, I do think objectively, many games released nowadays, same as most movies and entertainment in general, while look flashy and have massive budgets don't have those same things that hook a lot of players or moviegoers like they used to. They're made by, uh, they're made by people that don't like the, the medium. They're made by people that don't understand the medium, that don't understand the audience. 
And so like whenever they make a game, they make a game that they think gamers will like, but they're not a gamer. So it's like, how really can you possibly do that? that? Really waste my time. It's the Witcher show, and that is not a problem with the source material that it's based on. The source material is fantastic. I highly recommend you read the books, but don't watch the fucking show. Talk about a piece of media that wastes your time. Or what about a game like Back for Blood? That game completely dropped off and kind of flopped, mm -hmm. but the games that inspired it have lived on with healthy player counts and communities for over a decade. Yeah, I think it's because a lot of these games aren't developed by gamers anymore. If you start looking at a lot of the development teams at most studios, you start to learn that a large number of the employees are just people who worked at some other random tech company prior to the game studio, and only took this job because they needed a job in their field. A lot well, of it's just really, I mean, if you listen to, like, I think that, like, one thing that was really eye-opening for me was, like, if you listen to, like, Kevin Jordan talk about why certain things existed in Classic WoW, there is, like, a level of... Like, fucking, like, I'm trying to think of the word for it. A, a level of competency and fundamental human understanding that with a lot of developers, I hear them talk about the game of insight. Yeah, there's a degree of thoughtfulness and insight that doesn't exist with a lot of developers. And you can see that with, like, for example, uh, you know, Chris Wilson doesn't really do quite as many interviews, but, like, um, Jonathan from uh, PoE2, the guy with the glasses, you listen to him talk about the game, and it's like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for sure. 100%. Like, the way Miyazaki explains why different things in the game are the way they are, it's like, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I get it. And it's, like, such a big difference whenever you compare that with like some random interview with some developer or person that's in charge of a game and they're like yeah so we're gonna have it be like so fucking like uh there you go and there's like a dragon and shit it's like oh my god like this is just like what are we doing and it's just like just listen to them talk about games It's like I said with Diablo 4. You want to know what the problem is with the game? Watch the devs play it. Watch them talk about what they think about games. Oh, oh no, n now I understand. Oh, oh, okay, no, now I get it. I understand now. Right. It makes perfect sense. I'm very clueless as to what makes a game so encapsulating. Now, I know I've already lost some of you with that thought. It's like, you know, Kojima talking about his games and, like, the way that they're made versus the random studio that's making a psychological thriller that um, you're being texted on your smartphone by a demon. <laughs> What a bunch of fucking trash! But I think it's pretty evident when looking at the state of the industry today. You know, when a game like Baldur's 3 comes out, made for gamers, by gamers, that really care about the yeah. experience of the player, i.e. the customer, it's easy to see why they're so successful and sell so many copies, and become a big cultural phenomenon. We need games developed by gamers, for gamers that don't waste our time. Because that is what I believe makes gaming feel like a chore. But that's just one man's take on the idea. I think he's of totally fucking right. Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and I'll see you all in the next one. I unironically totally fucking agree. I think that most people that make video games are totally fucking clueless. I think they suck at video games. Yeah, you don't have to be good, but I fucking bet it's better if you are. And they don't have any idea. They actively, a lot of them, resent their audience, listen to, like, what they say on Twitter, look at the people they follow, look at the tweets they make, look at the tweets they like. These are people who have a fundamental resentment towards their own fucking audience. And I am just annoyed by this. I am. I'm very annoyed.
It's baffling. It is. I, I don't think that they're creative. I don't think it's like, for example, Steve Denuser, the guy that did a lot of the storylines for WoW, said that he liked Game of Thrones season eight. It's like, why did you like it? It's like you don't even understand. It's like, why, why was it? Because, like, he's not necessarily wrong in the same way that the storyline for Shadowlands wasn't necessarily bad. But it was bad because of the way that it was told. It was told in a way that was garbage. Yes, it was. No, no, I disagree. I completely disagree. I think that the way that they could have told the Shadowlands story was would have been it could have been the best story that they ever did. Uh, maybe it can't be Garrosh, but it could have been really up there. I think it absolutely could have, especially hundred percent. And I think Game of Thrones. I, I feel like it was obvious that Daenerys had to go fucking crazy. It's obvious. Like everybody fucking knew that. I thought John was going to kill her earlier in the show because she was going to stop him from going to war with the White Walkers. That's what I thought was going to happen. But, you know, it didn't. The point is that it felt rushed. Yeah, it was rushed. It was it was told badly the way it happened with shit. Exactly. Yeah, it's like they just don't understand. They don't get it. They just don't fucking get it. 